the University of Singapore, where he was awarded the Temasek Research Fellowship in 2015 and held co appointment between the Temasek Laboratories and Singapore Institute of Neurotechnology. In 2019, he joined the Neuromorphic Computer Laboratory Intel Labs in Santa Clara, California, as a senior research scientist. His research focuses on very inspired algorithms and architectures for visual sensing and computation. Thank you very much, Dr. Gary Orcutt. If you want to share your screen. Start sure. Let me share my screen here. Are you able to see the front slide now? Yes. yes. Okay, and it appears you can hear me, so I'm, I'm good to go, is it? Okay. So let me get started. I'd like to tell you all today about uh, our new chip that we've released in the Intel's Neuromorphic Computing Lab. The chip is dubbed Luigi 2 and tell you a bit about our Lava software framework that uh, is, is well something we first released over a year ago, but it's kind of an ongoing development effort that we're working on. And together these two things form some new tools that we think push, push us into a new era uh, for neuromorphic computing. So starting off with our overall research vision, our vision here is to develop uh, a new programmable computing technology that's inspired by a modern understanding of computation within the brain. So the classic example we use here is the parakeet on the left. You can imagine this bird as um, a very small, very lightweight, very low power brain, yet it's uh, capable of achieving some pretty remarkable things. Um, you know, it can fly around through uh, completely unknown environment, something it's never seen before. Uh, the environment can be dynamically changing, yet you can navigate very efficiently and effectively through that environment, traveling at very high speeds. And it, you know, it's almost effortless for this bird. Whereas by comparison, something like the quadcopter we're showing in the bottom left there um, would have to carry a small computer. It would be burning you know, many watts of power and is very limited in what it can do. Often it needs to be pre-trained to fly through an environment. Um, it doesn't necessarily handle dynamic environments well. Um, and often they still require you know, infrastructure sensors. And even with all of that, they cannot come anywhere near to matching the kind of speed and agility you might see from the parakeet. So clearly these are two very different computing paradigms. Um, so within the lab, you know, we're looking to see what is it that the brain does so well, and can we ex exploit our modern understanding of the brain to make you know, new computing technologies? Right. But this technology doesn't need to uh, only apply at the very edge, you know, not only to uh, parakeets and, and things with very small brains that are navigating through these environments, but we can imagine them also you know, doing some more kind of, uh, let's say, planning type work. Uh, maybe taking the place of like a desktop computer here, we've got in the middle of the slide, conventional client computing and edge computing. So maybe something that's not really just a, a tiny lightweight low power brain in a mobile system, but something that's really doing some, some real um, you know, computation without uh, going to the robotic side. Uh, and even further up than that, we can see these things finding application in, in uh, data centers. So we'd really like to be able to achieve brain-like efficiency, efficiency, speed, adapt adaptability, and intelligence over you know, all three of these different ranges, right? right from the edge to the data center and all the way in between. And we're striving not just to um, you know, match today's computing technologies, but we really want to be delivering uh, orders of magnitude gains in energy delay product. So the energy delay product is the energy it takes to um, reach a solution multiplied by the time it takes to get to the solution. Um, so we're looking at orders of you know, 10 to the four or higher. Okay. Now it's, it's a daunting task to try and mimic or um, emulate what the brain is doing, right? The brain offers a huge space of design uh, exploration that we could follow. I'm not gonna go and read off all these different items we have here on the slide. Um, the point is just to show that depending how closely we choose to mimic the brain or how accurately we choose to mimic it, you know, we might um, you know, choose to, to implement many of these different features that we have here. But at some point, we've got to say what makes the most sense for um, what we can implement today in modern silicon, modern CMOS, you know, without going to pains trying to uh, mimic or, or replicate aspects of the brain that aren't really going to benefit us in silicon. Right, so you can come up with some very exotic and uncommon properties in these things, you know, going as far as autonomous healing and self-growing materials, 
Um, but we're really sticking to Intel's bread and butter here, which is conventional digital CMOS electronics. So how do we approach such a task? Uh, we take this iterative architecture algorithm co-design approach where uh, you know, we have algorithms and software teams, and we have our silicon and hardware teams, and they learn from each other and, and we iterate both the hardware and with new hardware, we explore new algorithms. And as we explore new algorithms, we come up with ideas of how to tweak the hardware again. So we have this kind of co-design cycle illustrated in the middle of the slide. There's a decision tree shown on the left for the silicon. Many different decisions we could have made um, that could have arrived, uh, helped us to arrive at different sort of uh, chip implementations. So, you know, uh, I'm not going to go through all of them, but just to read quickly through each one to say, um, you know, what the thinking is. Uh, do we want to pursue neuro inspiration at all? Uh, do we want to integrate the memory with our compute? Do we want temporal neuron models, which I'll touch on the meaning of that in a moment? Um, are we going to stick with standard CMOS or go to you know, new, more exotic devices? The one area that we do, I think, is a little bit unusually in the neuromorphic computing lab is that we use this asynchronous design style, right? meaning there's no clock on our chips. Um, the, the circuits just operate asynchronously. It's still conventional digital CMOS logic, um, but the design style and the design tools are a bit different. And in fact, we maintain our own tools uh, in-house. Uh, we could have decided to integrate analog circuits in the chips, uh, which we didn't. And finally, do we want to support plasticity? So the, the ability of the chip to learn or modify its configuration on the fly through, through data that it's processing. So we kind of followed the decision tree on the left all the way down and arrived at the Luigi chip. But if we'd taken a different decision at any one of these branches in the tree, we would have arrived at, at a different architecture, right? From anything from a conventional CPU to a GPU to even other neuromorphic architectures, which are, you know, of which there are many um, that make their own kind of decisions towards the bottom of this tree. On the algorithm side, we explored a very wide range of algorithms from conventional deep learning and backdrop trained algorithms, which are, you know, prevalent in AI today to some kind of further out more exciting new ideas in high dimensional computing and vector symbolic architectures, um, attractor networks, which cover you know, some of the neural engineering framework field and uh, dynamic neural fields, um, oscillatory computation. So just having oscillators as the, as the basic unit of computation, many different kinds of algorithmic areas that we can look at within the neuromorphic uh, architecture. So, at all stages here, we, we're rigorously benchmarking the results. We're trying to see, you know, how many cycles does it take to, um, you know, of uh, how many cycles does it take for us to reach a, a good solution? How uh, efficiently does the hardware implement it and learn from these to improve both the algorithms and, and the, the silicon architecture? Okay, so arguably the, the key differentiator of our chip um, at a low level is that the neurons we, that we use have dynamics. So people are very used to in, in deep learning um, today, the idea of constructing large networks of neurons connected via synapses. But these, net, these neurons are what we describe uh, on the left here as artificial uh, stateless neurons, meaning the neurons output at any point in time is purely a function of its inputs at that point in time. There's no history, right? It doesn't have any dependence on previous inputs. It doesn't have any internal time varying state. And this is in stark contrast to a spiking neuron, which is on the right-hand side, where it's inherently processing time series data, right? Spikes, um, you know, ones and zeros coming in over a period of time that affect the internal state of this neuron. And that internal state um, evolves with some internal dynamics and then produces these output spikes showing going out towards the right there. So the key differentiator here is that the neuron on the right has some internal time varying state that um, evolves according to some dynamics and its output at any point in time is dependent on not only the current input to the neuron, but also the previous inputs to that neuron. So the neuron has some, some form of memory inside it. Um, so we could see this as, as a nonlinear filter on the table. Right. We have chosen the asynchronous design style, as I mentioned before. So if we imagine uh, in this top row here, uh, we have this grid of blocks, each one of these could be a neuron, and only four of these neurons are strongly enough activated that they need to output some data. Right? These four neurons can be arbitrated onto a bus, and this, these four pieces of data can be read out very quickly. They don't have to wait for any clock edges, they don't have to wait for any other neurons to be output, they just go straight out. Whereas on the bottom side, 
you know, if we have, we're in a more uh, typical kind of a synchronous architecture, we'd have to go query all these neurons and sort them to find out which were the most activated. And so reading out all that data is going to add latency and communication. And of course it costs you in terms of energy as well. Uh, many modern approaches do implement some form of sparsity, but it's usually a very rigid sparsity. Um, meaning uh, if we imagine that each one of these squares here is again a neuron, um, we might enforce some sparsity so that we're only ever querying say the black and red dots, but even within the black and red dots, there may be only very few red dots that we want to read out. So the take home message from the slide is that in the face of sparsity, asynchronous communication is very fast and efficient. And so our algorithm and our architecture that we um, implement are all targeting sparsity. Okay, so these design decisions, they, they lead us to a new class of computer architecture. I think we're all familiar with the far left standard CPU architecture, right? So sequential thread, sequential, you know, sequence of instructions that are being implemented uh, at very high speed on the CPU. More recently, people have been shifting towards parallel computing. These would be more like your GPUs. Instead of writing a sequence of instructions to be executed, you train a model offline using very large labeled data sets. Um, so this is a big move towards parallel computation, but neuromorphic computing on the far right there, you know, takes things a few steps further in, in, in a few of the areas. So one is the ability to learn on the fly through neuron firing rules. So this means learning happening within the chip online, right? Meaning not offline with labeled data, but online while new data is being processed. Um, asynchronous event-based spike communication. This is just a design style choice that we've made. Um, but it's also, it's highly, highly parallel and but with very sparse compute. So many parallel elements, each of which can be doing a different thing, and but only very few of them are active at any point in time, right? Which is very different to having these very large, dense, say matrix vector multiplications that you would find in many um, deep learning architectures. So we realized all of this in Luigi, which was the first chip that we released. This is, uh, you know, uh, end of 2017, early 2018. Some of the key properties uh, to highlight again here, the compute and memory are integrated. So all the memory for the chip is inside the cores themselves. There's no separate DRAM. Uh, we have these temporal neuron models. So the neuron models with internal time varying state. The neurons communicate with each other with spike-based uh, communication. So very sparse communication only when a neuron is very strongly activated or it then outputs some data and reset. The connectivity between the neurons is sparse as well. Um, the cores have this ability to learn on chip um, and it's all just fully uh, uh, asynchronous, right? So it's still digital, but fully asynchronous implementation. Um, something that we work a lot on in the lab, uh, that something that maybe many teams find, you know, a, a bit difficult, but our team's got a lot of experience with this and, and we actually find it to be a very productive design style for us. Perhaps more surprisingly is um, what is not included in the chip, which are, uh, there are no floating point numbers anywhere in the chip. There are no multiplied accumulators anywhere in the chip and there's no off-chip DRAM. And so these are things that are kind of fundamental to deep learning hardware, and yet that we don't have in our neuromorphic chip. So we've learned a lot from this chip over the last you know, few years. We, we built a, a, a large community um, over, I believe it's 180 different research teams from around the world and are part of the Intel neuromorphic research community. We have 14,500 companies, government labs, um, uh, but mostly academic researchers and academic labs from around the world. Uh, we've built edge-based systems interface to dynamic vision sensors. We've built large rack scale systems with hundreds of chips. Uh, we've had NASA send, uh, in collaboration with the Air Force here in the US, send uh, Louis He up into space, into orbit, and planning to do so again. We've generated you know, a wide range of results on, on many, many different tasks that I'm gonna to touch on in the next few slides. Um, so we really feel like we've, we've made significant process over these last few years and learned a lot about the technology. Um, and we think Louise really confirmed the value of this, this direction that we've taken. Some of the examples shown here, um, this is actually me on the top left, swinging my arm around in front of the sensor. Uh, we showed that we can do this kind of gesture learning or uh, gesture recognition at very low power with a dynamic vision sensor coupled to the Louise chip. So this is operating on about 60 milliwatts total power, uh, only 15 milliwatts of which is dynamic while, you know, uh, detecting these 10 different gestures and, and classifying them in, in real time. Uh, more recently, that work's been extended to allow online learning of new gestures on the chip, uh, again, just while observing um, you know, somebody performing them. In the bottom left, we have adaptive robotic arm control, 
the task here, this is just a simulation. You see the task being performed. There's a robotic arm that must be controlled um, to just move from point to point. And there's a pretty simple task um, in the absence of any load. But the moment the robot, robotic arm has to pick up a weight of some kind, there's suddenly this large you know, weight on the end or mass on the end of the arm. Um, and you need to change uh, your controller or adapt your controller to uh, counteract that weight. So with our chip, we're able to operate at 40x lower power than, um, than the GPU, and we're able to adapt 50% faster. Combinatorial optimization um, is another one that I'm going to touch on in a few of the future slides. Uh, but the take home message just from this slide on that is, is that we're able to achieve you know, thousands of times lower energy than a conventional CPU and find solutions you know, many times fast, in this case, 44 times fast for, uh, I believe this is a Sudoku. We had some results in olfaction inspired odor recognition and learning. So how do you learn to recognize new odors when you've only been presented with them once or twice? And odors are just inherently a very kind of noisy um, signal. And we're able to show you know, 3,000 times more data efficient learning than a deep autoencoder. We also have a number of efforts ongoing in scene understanding, so visual scene understanding, tracking uh, head motions, object recognition, learning uh, at very low power, and you know, doing SLAM uh, 100x lower power than versus a CPU. These results that I'm mentioning here are all summarized in a, a paper that we released last year, um, the citation for which is at the bottom of this uh, slide. So part of the point of this you know, research effort at building this community is to find out what the technology is good for, and of course, along the way, figure out what it's not good for. Um, so this is one of the take home plots from that paper, um, again, cited just at the bottom of the page here, where we try to measure for a wide variety of tasks, how well we're performing using the energy delay product. So energy, uh, we always compute a ratio, the energy that it took our chip to find a solution, versus the energy that it took a competing approach. So it's always a comparison point between our chip versus some other solution. So the horizontal axis here, the further you move to the right, the more advantage Luigi has on a specific task. And conversely, of course, the further you are to the left, um, the less advantage we have uh, compared to conventional solutions. Similarly for the vertical axis, uh, that's the solution time ratio. So how quickly can we find a solution? The higher up we are uh, within this plot, the quicker Luigi is at finding a solution versus a conventional approach, and the lower we are, the worse. So we typically multiply these two um, ratios together to get an energy delay product. And so the parity line is shown by this dashed line, uh, oblique line going across the plot. Um, Anything that is above or to the right of this line is somewhere where Luigi, our chip, um, it has better energy delay product than competing solutions. And anything that's below it, uh, we're performing worse. So ideally, we'd love to be at the top right of this plot for everything. But in practice, of course, we see results spread out all over the place. Um, but we can see some trends already if we look at this, uh, this plot. First of all, we see that feed forward deep neural networks are, are really the worst class for us. Um, they offer the least gains, or in some cases, no gains at all for Luigi. Now, this is not too surprising. Uh, we're, we're not out to make a better deep neural network accelerator than all the other companies that are out there uh, playing that game. We're hoping to unlock you know, some new values, some new kind of uh, computational capabilities that aren't offered by those types of accelerators. Um, and with very broad strokes, we can say that the networks in the top right of this plot where we do see great advantage are recurrent networks. Um, it's probably a bit of an oversimplification because these networks are spanning a wide variety of tasks. You can see them uh, on the right there. Uh, sequential MNIST, uh, the adaptive robotic arm controller. Um, there's some sparse coding problems. There's SLAM problems, um, k-nearest neighbor problems, graph search problems, constraint satisfaction problems, just a very wide range of, of, of tasks that we're able to tackle. But common property between them is that they don't have uh, a predictable feed forward type of architecture. Um, they have you know, the ability for any neuron in the network to connect to any other neuron, which we dub here as a, a recurrent network. If we zoom far in on the top right of this plot, we see that the, the best examples we have today are um, optimization tasks. So uh, three of the main ones here is what are the best features or what are the features, sorry, that best explain some sensory input that I'm seeing at the moment. 
So we get some input from a sensor, we have a dictionary of possible uh, elements that could be used to describe what we're seeing, and we want to pick out which are the best ones that most closely describe that, that sensory stimulus. Another is, um, what is the shortest path to my goal? Again, this is kind of a graph where anything can be connected to anything. It's a kind of a current network. And we want to know what's the shortest path between two points uh, within this graph. Or uh, what is the shortest path while visiting each of, the, uh, of a number of waypoints exactly once? It's another variation of the, the graph search problem. So a key insight here, again, uh, I, I'd mentioned that the recurrent networks are the area that we see the biggest advantage. Um, so our neuromorphic networks, they have this interconnection between neurons in any directions, and they kind of just iterate um, towards a solution. We find that they can do so very efficiently and very quickly. And this is very different to what you see in conventional deep networks, which are typically feed forward. Um, so they require a different architecture, right? The, the feed forward networks, you can accurately predict which neurons need to be updated when, because you know when you're gonna feed data in and you know how the data is gonna flow through the network. But you know, if, if they don't find a good solution, they don't have a chance to continue operate, uh, sorry, to continue iterating to find a better solution. Right, where the neuromorphic network on the right can continue iterating and finding better and better solutions, basically performing gradient descent um, until it finds a, a satisfactory solution. Okay, so this, this slide kind of summarizes it again. We can imagine that we have a network on the right that's a recurrent network, things are all connected to each other, um, but the dynamics of the network are set up in such a way that the network is always forced to move down a gradient, right? The neural dynamics descend some gradient of the problem that we're trying to solve. So we can imagine that we're moving down this gradient, but the problem is it's inherently noisy. Our, our chip is it's very low precision, fixed precision uh, throughout the chip. And there are a lot of random noise sources within the chip itself that we um, exploit and, and, and put in there intentionally. Uh, and together this can give us a form of stochastic gradient descent where we can descend down a gradient, but if we hit a local minimum as shown here, we still have the ability to use the stochasticity to get kicked out of it and eventually traverse down to an even better solution. Some very exciting work that we've been seeing here is that Louis has been shown to outperform leading optimization solvers by orders of magnitude. On the left, we have the example of Kubo, um, quadratic unconstrained binary optimization. Here, the task is to find the maximum independent set in a uh, set of vertices. Um, and it's, it's a very interesting problem because it's the target of the current state-of-the-art quantum annealing approaches, and it's an NP-hard problem. So people are going after this with quantum computing um, technology, it's NP-hard. Um, but today we can solve these types of problems on Luihi at you know, orders of magnitude more efficiently than it's being done with a, a CPU. On the right, we have an integer linear programming task. This is a, a train scheduling problem that Deutsche Bahn was tackling. Um, so you can imagine you've got to figure out how to you know, schedule all the trains in your network subject to many constraints of how trains might move and how they can't crash into each other and um, supply or sorry, uh, customer demand. Um, so something that has large scale real world use. Uh, and you, you can imagine this being applicable to many other tasks as well, right? So not just how do you deploy trains on, on the train network, but all kinds of resource allocation tasks from you know, warehouses to production lines to, I'm not sure you can imagine military applications and, and many others. And here again, Luigi is uh, performing in this case, five orders of magnitude better on the energy delay product than, uh, than a conventional CPU with a state-of-the-art solver running on. So we, we think that there's some really promising results here. We've gained a lot of understanding of the technology and um, we're now kind of ready to take the next step. We believe we're moving into a new era of neuromorphic computing. Um, so the, the computational value there has been proven. We know we can make these kinds of things with today's manufacturing tech at Intel. Um, but we believe it motivates a new computational paradigm, right? So cheap and continuous optimization is, is one area that we are seeing you know, very large gains for us. Um, we've seen many successful learning algorithms, but this is still an area so we need to explore a bit further. Most of them being quite shallow learning algorithms on the chip, not really training very large deep networks um, online at least. And the types of applications we're going after are things that are power constrained, latency constrained, we're processing real-time signals. So 
imagine say a robotics application, we have sensory data coming in in real time. This is something where you wanna be processing data as it's arriving as quickly as possible. Right? So low latency, processing real time signals, um, it's power constrained, often you know, these robots are carrying batteries and, and so forth that need to power them. Um, they may be moving into new environments or changing environments. So you know, there might be some slowly evolving structure to the problem that you're solving uh, that can benefit from some shallow learning, right? So learning new, new objects in the environment, for example. But you can always apply deep learning initially to give you a starting point. So offline on a GPU, you can train a model, deploy it to our chip, and then have the chip learn online uh, from there forward. And so we should take a moment here to just recognize how this is different from, say, um, a GPU type of architecture where they really excel at batch processing. So um, if you have a real world signal that you want to react to with low, low latency, you don't really want to be waiting until you've batched 100 signals and then processing them in a, in a large chunk, right? You want to say, I, I don't need to process 100 at a time. I need to process one at a time and I need to do it very quickly. So it's a bit of a different you know, computational paradigm there. There are, however, challenges and headwinds. Um, first of all, we do have a pretty high cost for our chips. Um, the, the chips themselves uh, integrate all memory into the cores, and you know, adding that memory takes up silicon area and makes it expensive. Right? So we don't have DRAM, we have on-chip SRAMs, and that means that our, our, our chips are going to be pricey. Um, we still need more maturity in the algorithms and programming models. So uh, there are many exciting algorithmic approaches that have been shown, but we need some way to kind of pull them together and have programming models that we can introduce to new users to get them started. And this really ties into the software convergence problem there. A lot of people in the field so far are um, you know, doing one-off solutions that just show you know, how good their particular application is, but it, they're not really able to transfer it or release it to other labs for them to use or combine it with work that other people are doing because everyone's kind of writing their own piece of software. Um, so what we hope to drive you know, moving forward is convergence and getting everyone behind one piece of software, even if they're doing completely different things, right? Someone who's doing audio processing and vision processing, they should be able to combine it in the same robot without requiring completely different um, you know, software frameworks. So we're moving towards trying to solve, um, you know, these problems. Uh, one thing is that we've uh, recently released in, you know, about the last year, the greatly improved Luigi 2 chip. Uh, it's about half the area of our first Luigi chip. Uh, it's using uh, uh, an early pre-production version of the Intel 4 process. Um, yet it makes many improvements over the first chip. And so despite being half the size, uh, it's about 10x faster, the circuits themselves. There's a combination of process manufacturing advantages and um, you know, uh, architecture and design changes that we've made. We've improved the capacity. So despite, again, being half the size, we have 8x uh, more neurons per chip and just far better scaling and integration. So even on our first chips, we were able to combine many chips into a single system uh, through kind of a 2D mesh of chips. We've now expanded that to a 3D mesh of chips. Um, the chips speak with much higher bandwidth with each other. They also require less bandwidth because we implement you know, greater compression and new IO protocols between the chips. Um, we've also implemented 10 gig ethernet. So a way to just get you know, a lot of data in and out of the chip really quickly. Otherwise, some aspects of the chips, uh, the Luigi 2 chip remain pretty similar to Luigi 1. It's a chip consisting of 128 neuromorphic cores, you know, each implementing many neurons, and they communicate with other chips nearby using parallel off-chip interfaces, which allow you to scale up from a single chip to you know, large data center type systems with many chips. Um, and each chip has a number of microprocessor cores on chip. Uh, these handle things like data IO to the rest of the cores. Uh, they can monitor and configure the network um, you know, and just do any kind of maintenance task. You can even imagine, um, say, a, a neurogenesis type algorithm where neurons are being added to a network and the structure of the network is evolving over time under control of C code running on one of these microprocessor cores. Um, because the SRAM on chip is pretty expensive, uh, we've put a, a lot of effort into making sure we get the absolute most out of the SRAM that we possibly can. Um, so this is done in, in two different ways with Luigi 2 now. One is that the SRAM is shared between all the different features. So you know, to take a simplistic view, if we imagine that a, a network consists of neurons and synapses, uh, in Luigi 1, you had a fixed amount of memory for neurons and a fixed amount of memory for synapses. In Luigi 2, um, they can share memory. So if you have a circular model that 
they skewed very heavily towards synapses, you can just allocate more memory to the synapses and less to the neurons and vice versa. Um, so there's a lot more flexibility in how you allocate the memory, but there's also far greater uh, ability to compress data in memory, right? So our neuron state is typically compressed by four times now in Luigi 2 versus Luigi 1, axon writing by 256 times. But really most of the compression happens in the synaptic connectivity. We have a number of different features for compressing synapses from built-in support for convolutional kernels to factorized um, uh, weight matrices to procedurally generated um, pseudo-stochastic uh, you know, uh, lists of weights in each core. The Wii one also used binary spikes with leaky integrated phi neuron models, which are, means we could only have one bit spikes and we had a very rigid um, neuron model. Uh, the leaky integrated fire model, we here to generalizes this concept. So we have generalized spikes that can now carry a payload between uh, neurons and the neurons themselves um, are uh, just governed by some microcode that the user writes themselves. And this means that the user has the, has the freedom to write kind of an almost arbitrary neuron model um, based on you know, what it is that they need. Right, so we've generalized the spikes, we've generalized the neuron model, we've made sure you can compress the memory far more, we've added flexibility in how you allocate the memory and taken advantage of you know, the Intel 4 uh, uh, you know, pre-production technology to, to arrive at the Wii U2. This is just an image of the chip itself here. This would be the chip in the package on the top left. This is just kind of the die shown on someone's fingertip. This is about four millimeters by eight millimeters in total. And of course, we've been putting these chips down into systems and um, you know, implementing some workloads on them and characterizing them. And overall, you know, not, not surprisingly, we see that Luigi 2 does offer us significant advantages over Luigi 1. Um, circuits are quite a bit faster for neurons and synapses. Uh, our time steps can advance much faster. So that's just a measure say, of how quickly we can process data. And we're able to lower the energy quite a bit uh, versus the first Luigi chip. Um, we are starting to release systems to people. Um, you can see our here gulch at the top there. That's kind of a large uh, single chip system just for kind of basic bring up, but we've been starting to expose those for the last year or so. And we have point systems at the moment, the bottom left, which are eight chips in a single small board. It's about the, the length of a credit card squared um, that our uh, INRC users will have access to. Um, Deep learning hasn't been the greatest area for us with Luigi, uh, but it is one of the areas where we can just take a model off the shelf and implement it on Luigi 2 to get an idea of the advantages that we're seeing. Um, and it's, we're seeing pretty significant advantage of, advantages over the first Luigi chip. Uh, we'd implemented the simple pilot net model on Luigi 1. The task here is simply to estimate steering wheel angle from dashboard video. Um, so the Luigi 1 numbers are shown on the very left column here. We implemented the exact same model, right? It's an equivalent model on Luigi 2. So it achieves the exact same mean square error, um, you know, spike for spike, neuron for neuron, it's the same. Yet uh, we're able to shrink the model by about five times in the number of cores it requires. Uh, we're able to drop the latency down by a factor of about six. And we're able to increase the throughput by a factor of about six too. Um, we're also able to, uh, to lower the total energy by a factor of six. This is a, a, a pretty good gain for Luigi 2, but this is just implementing the exact same Luigi 1 model on the new architecture. Luigi 2 includes you know, a number of new uh, features that we can exploit as well, the graded spikes, programmable neuron models, and so forth, um, which allow to implement models that Luigi 1 cannot. So on the far right here, we see the advantage of trying to exploit those models, uh, sorry, those properties. We see the, uh, by exploiting them, we're able to drop our mean square error down by about 30% of what we're achieving with Luigi 1, while almost doubling um, our efficiency and doubling our throughput again. So this is you know, a, a very early um, example task that we're performing on the chip, but we're very encouraged by it. There's a wide range of uh, exploration that we can um, explore now based on the new programmable neuron models. Uh, we published a paper last year um, anyone can go look at if they're interested in seeing the kind of things we've been looking at doing. Uh, uh, for example, resonate and fire neurons. This is a, a totally different type of neuron model where the neurons now have some complex time varying um, oscillatory internal state. And we can use that to implement a type of frequency filter. 
And using these frequency filters, we can do things like spectral decomposition of an audio chirp on the right here. So you can imagine approximating the, the short time Fourier transform um, with a bank of, of these neurons, all of different resonant frequencies. Um, and you can use these filters to um, apply some energy-based optical flow models to dynamic vision sensor data. So this is another one of the tasks we presented there, um, optical flow for event-based cameras. So we have an event-based camera producing data coming into our chip that we can process with um, these resonant fine neurons. And if we arrange them all correctly, uh, according to some, you know, so this is theory that uh, came out in about the 80s, but we're able to do it very efficiently on our chip and we're able to show that we could uh, achieve better accuracy than state-of-the-art deep learning approaches are achieving on these event-based camera optical flow tasks while requiring about 90x fewer ops, uh, fewer operations um, you know, to compute the solution. So we think these are very exciting areas for us to look into uh, you know, moving forwards. So I've touched a bit there um, on the, uh, the headwinds that we saw. I, I mentioned that we, we see a headwind in the costs of silicon because we have this on-chip memory. I described a bit about you know, the things we're doing to try to compress that memory and make our, our allocation of it more flexible. Um, we, we do need maturity as well on the algorithm side. I've described a little bit about some of the exciting new features we put on the chip and some of the algorithms we're starting to look at. But I'd mentioned how a lot of this really ties into um, uh, having a convergence around a common software framework, you know, something that everyone in the community can get behind. And so our you know, proposed solution to this is Lava. It's a, it's a new software framework for neuromorphic computing. It's not so new in the, anymore. You know, we've been talking about it for a year plus now. Um, but it's something that we believe can really pull together a lot of different aspects you know, within the community and make it far easier for people to uh, share code with each other, um, publish their results as kind of modules that can be reused by other teams, you know, and build up to far more complex applications by picking and using uh, you know, pieces of code from different people. So our vision here is really just enable mainstream adoption of neuromorphic technologies. Lava is a, it's an open source software framework. We've been very careful not to, you know, put Intel's name into the uh, name anywhere there. The idea is that we're hoping that the community will get behind this and you know take some ownership of it and, and, and contribute towards its development. We're of course getting the ball rolling, um, you know, putting significant effort within the team ourselves here into getting Lava off the ground. And so it's a combination of two things. Um, one, it, it's a software tools for um, productive development environment, but also you know, through design of the software environment, uh, we have the ability to kind of, um, you know, so let's say manipulate a bit how we want people to think about programming a neuromorphic device. And it's just, it's something that's absent today. You know, the, the easy thing for people to do is to take a deep neural network off the shelf uh, standard feed forward network and try run that on the chip. And it's something we support through the tools and something that can be done, but it's just not a strong point for us. Um, so we see the need to kind of change people's thinking about how they should approach programming a neuromorphic chip. So some of the key attributes of LAVA, which I'll dive into in a moment here, um, are event-based communication. So there's kind of the sparse communication that's very you know, event-based, so it's not necessarily uh, predictable or on a predictable schedule. And this communication is happening between many different processes that are operating in parallel. You can imagine how this um, translates to the chip where we have many neurons that are all operating in parallel, communicating um, with each other in an event-based manner. And it's, it's a multi-paradigm, multi-abstraction, multi-platform software framework. And I'm going to touch on what those three things mean in the next few slides. Again, it's, it's open source, permissive licensing for all of the core components. Anyone can come in and use it. Um, you do require a special agreement with us to be able to run it on our specific hardware, right on our Luigi chips. But it also allows you to, at the multi-platform part here, it allows you to run it on the standard CPU or GPU as well, which means that we kind of open the door for people who don't have access to our chips to do their own software and algorithm development. Uh, furthermore, we, it, it is so open that other um, uh, neuromorphic computing uh, labs who are developing their own hardware are even free to come in and you know, write the, the support to add their hardware back in. And so kind of the ultimate dream is that you'd be able to write some kind of module that you've kind of, you've written it in the right way. And then just by changing a flag somewhere, you can make it run on either a CPU, GPU, our hardware, or maybe even someone else's hardware that they've put in. 
I, I won't go too much through the um, table on the right there, other than just to say that we looked at a number of other software frameworks that were out there, including our own previous software framework, which was this NX SDK here. And we just, with each one, we we're able to kind of pick some holes in it. Um, and Lava is, is the solution that we feel covers all the points that we needed to cover uh, with this new software framework. Okay, so it's multi-paradigm. Um, so I'm not saying that there's only one way that you can use a neuromorphic architecture. Um, so we're targeting things like the optimization approaches that I've shown you uh, on the previous slides, neural attractors. We have many people working in the lab at this at the moment. You hear Sandra Muskaya has a, a lot of research happening at uh, ETH Zurich there. So we've got some notifications popping up here. Um, yeah, so she's done a lot of work on dynamic neural fields. So we have software libraries for neural attractors being built into Lava, software libraries for optimization being built into Lava. Um, software libraries for deep learning built into Lava and even vector symbolic architectures. We have some researchers with us um, from the Redwood Center for Neuroscience at Berkeley, who've done a lot of good uh, recent theoretical work on uh, BSAs. So you can expect to see within Lava um, software libraries for all these different you know, paradigms, different ways of computing. It's also multi abstraction. So uh, you can imagine that some people really want to dig into the details. They want to write their own um, details of how one small part of a neuron model might work. But other people just want to use the technology. Right? They, um, they, they just want a, a prepackaged neuron model that they can take home um, and just use off the shelf. Some people don't even want to deal with that. Right? They say, I, I want to build a network of these neurons and um, yeah, just, just give me the pieces I need. I'll, I'll build a network and describe the connectivity myself. And B, there might be people at an even higher level than that that say, um, I, I don't really care that these things are neurons. I, I just want a module that does some you know, block of computation for me. I, I want a, uh, a network that optimizes this class of problem. And I don't want to think about the fact that it consists of neurons and synapses and all these details. And people might even go um, a level above that and say, well, you know, I, I want some uh, model that combines many of these different properties in a single module. Um, so I want to you know, uh, optimize my path to some location and then control the robot to get there. And that can just be you know, presented as a, as a prepackaged module without people worrying about what the bits and pieces uh, underlying it are. So I hope we can expose all these different levels of abstraction. Multi-platform is very important to us. Um, not only the ability for uh, to have different devices that can talk to each other, right? A single system that could consist of CPU, GPU, FPGA, Luigi chips, um, you, know, you know, other things that you might imagine, uh, all communicating to each other through the Lava software framework, but also just the ability for someone to be able to switch from one um, hardware back end to another, right? So, you know, some PhD student in the lab somewhere has a good idea of something he wants to develop, but he, he doesn't have access to our chips. So he wants to develop on a CPU or GPU or whatever is available to him. And so it's important to us that people can develop at a kind of more abstract level, but then really, you know, once they feel they've got something good, obviously we highly encourage them to, to run it on our chips because we feel that, you know, that specific hardware will give them a real performance advantage. But, okay, of course, CPU only, if you're just wanting to do some offline kind of algorithm exploration and prototyping. And so we've released a number of different early versions of Lava so far over about the last year. Most recently, we've added support for Luigi 2 as we released it and fully automated compilation for the chip um, and the ability to program different parts of the chip using either Python or C or both. Uh, support for the new microcode programmable neuron models and haptic plasticity um, and just you know, really extended our documentation high level tutorials for it. Uh, in the very near term, you can expect us to have you know, full Wii 1 and 2 support and you know, extended algorithm libraries for the deep learning, optimization, dynamic neural fields, and vector symbolic architecture work that I was describing before. So overall, just to re-emphasize, um, we really see an, uh, the ability to apply this type of technology at multiple different levels here. We've, we've come across many different algorithms that we see great promise in. We've built our own systems with Luigi 1 from single chip up to hundreds of chips. We see us, ourselves, of course, doing the same for Luigi 2. We see the ability to even have um, 
just IP blocks that can be built into other chips, right? We have uh, currently the Luihi and Luihi 2 chips each have 128 neuron cores, but you could imagine um, solving a problem with only a few neuron cores. In fact, you, you can with some audio problems get away with just one or two cores. So you can imagine implementing those as kind of side IP on, on another chip for processing. As we scale up, you can imagine maybe edge co-processors, you know, processing you know, camera feed, something like that, maybe uh, being carried by a robot or a UAV. So helping to do some um, sensory processing, decision-making and optimization, and maybe some motor control or scaling up all the way with other some you know, K nearest neighbor recommendation system type approaches that would be run in a data center. And we believe we've kind of brought together, you know, through the community that we've been building, Intel Neuromorphic Research Community, many people showing these exciting results. We've got a, you know, this, we're on the verge of this new software framework that's pulling a lot of it together. And we've taken what we've learned over the last few years and put it into the Luigi 2 chip. A number of new features that have really, um, you know, blown wide open this exploration space that we have ahead of us. Uh, and we think is you know, going to lead to some exciting things in, in the near future. So with that, I'll, I'll conclude this part of the talk. I'm, I'm happy to take some questions. Um, I, I will highlight at the bottom there, if you found any of this interesting, you'd like to get involved, find out more, you can email inrc underscore interest at intel.com to get more information. Um, you know, we have a number of different tiers, simply reaching out can get you on some of our mailing lists, get you access to some more of our information. Um, but if you're interested in actually getting access to our hardware and software and chips and doing something there yourself, you know, we have uh, kind of additional levels of engagement. We run um, workshops, regular talks, and try, really are trying to build this you know, community and get people to share results and, and come together there. So please you know, get involved if you're interested. If you liked what you saw about Lava, Again, it's completely open source. You can visit the link there down the bottom to, to get involved, see what we're doing, download it, and try it out for yourself. Thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, if you have some questions, please. I have a question. Uh... Hello, I heard someone say they have a question, but I didn't hear anything afterwards. Okay, can you hear him now? Can you hear me? I hear you now. Okay, well, uh, this is Ricardo Gooding from uh, University of Campinas in Brazil. And uh, I'd like to know uh, how, uh, how is the pathway for getting uh, access to this technology and trying to, to, to use it in, in experiments? Is there some uh, university relationship uh, kind of programs that we could have this, this chip or we have to buy it? What, what, what are the, the, the pathways for, for getting access to this uh, technology? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so we're building that Intel Neuromorphic Research Community that I mentioned. You, you, if you reach out to this email address down below, they can get you started with access. Um, we, we don't sell these chips. Uh, we're, we're not at the product stage yet. This is a research processor. Um, so we provide access to people through a few different ways. Uh, our preference is cloud access. So we can give you remote access to run on our systems. And that just allows us to maintain the systems and share the systems between many users. And of course, we, we have some more control over the software environment to keep things stable. But as soon as people, you know, are, can show us that they're getting some interesting results, you know, we're happy to, to send hardware along as well. So we've provided hardware to, to many labs um, you know, we do it under typically a loan agreement, a bailment agreement. So again, it's not it's not something where there's any kind of purchase or, or money changing hands. It's you know something where we see, hey, there's interesting results here. Let's let's get these people some chips to work with. Um, but it's typically motivated by having some results in order or or by need of the project, right? If, if inherently you need chips in the lab because you know you need to process some signals in real time or you're doing some robotics work, um, and then you know there's a clear reason why the cloud is not good enough. Yeah, my idea is to present it to my students and, and give, give it to them and see what they can do uh, using it. Do, do you think it's a, a good pathway for, for trying? Um, well, I think we'd, we'd encourage it, but I'd, I'd still push them towards the cloud access route. You know, we can give people remote access to, to run things, um, and it just takes a lot of the, the difficulty out of, out of physical hardware, right? Uh, getting Getting large quantities for teaching is is, is maybe problematic. Um, you know, it's, it's something we can do, but with, throughout the community, we do have quite high demand for these, and we are kind of 
manufacturing them, not with like a you know production scale. So uh, our, our quantities are limited. Okay, thank you. Is there any other question? Uh, yes, I have a question. Please. Go ahead, please. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the talk. Uh, I have a question about uh, physical neurons uh, on Loki. Uh, uh, can we run multiple neurons, I mean, uh, abstract neurons on phys one physical neuron? Or we have a one-to-one -one direct uh, uh, connection between physical and you know, programmable model? Yeah, no, we, um, you know, digital CMOS is very fast. So we use time multiplexing. Uh, so within a core, um, it's reusing the, the, the hardware. Uh, you know, when we say you can implement up to 8,000 neurons on a core, uh, we're not saying that there are 8,000 neuron circuits on a core. Uh, what we're saying is that you're going to start running into the memory capacity limits of the core for holding the states and you know, um, the models of those neurons. So oh, okay. the answer is yes, you, you can have multiple different neurons. You can even have multiple different neurons with different neuron models. Um, running on the same core, and that means they are using the same hardware. That they're, they're not separate physical circuits for each neuron. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other question? No? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Rokar. And we continue with the schedule of the meetings. Thank you yeah. very much. Thanks very much for having me.